It was said to be an eight foot tall bat-like creature with huge featherless wings. It had a blunt horn coming out of its forehead and that's where the light was produced. I have to give Dr. Alcott credit. He wasn't frightened. He started shooting this thing. Shot it five different times. Kept the last bullet for himself if he needed it. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, I'm one of the authors of the book, uh, The Van Meter Visitor, and I'll be your tour guide this evening. This is Chad Lewis. He is a researcher, author, and lecturer on topics of the strange and unusual. His background is actually in psychology, and he has earned both his bachelor's and his master's degree in the field. But for the last 30 years, he has traveled the world in search of high strangeness. A short list of his adventures include searching for Mothman evidence in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, looking for the Wendigo in Canada, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan, vampire hunting in Transylvania, researching the Van Meter Visitor in Iowa, it is safe to say that unlike most popular ghost hunters you find on YouTube, this guy is the real deal. And we put this together so we could go on a small, more compact tour rather than tomorrow's big tours where we can really get into depth. Is that a weather warning? Okay. So we can really get into the depth of the legend without the big crowd. So at any time, this is your tour. If you have questions, comments, or want something uh, clarified, please let me know. We also have a lot of the speakers tomorrow here in the crowd, so you can talk with them if you have questions as well. Oh, okay, we got Allison Jornwin here. Uh, Kevin Lee Nelson next to her, uh, Rebecca Hansen, Steve Ward's our MC, Jeremiah Byron in the back there with the Small Town Monsters hat on, uh, Laura Cram here in the purple, um, is that it? We've got uh, Creepy Acres Puppet, uh, what do you call your show puppeting? Send the ransom. What is it? What do, what? what do you oh. call it? I don't want to describe it as adult puppeting. Oh. Because <laughs> it's triple X rated. It's cryptid, it's cryptid comedy not for kids. Yeah, it's for sexy puppetry. <laughs> <laughs> and they've cursed me on their show before. A couple times I've been cursed on the show. So, all right, so let's start. So it really was late September, 119 years ago, in 1903, when the visitor made its appearance here, a local implement dealer, which worked in tools and vehicles, was coming back late at night about 1 a.m. He pulled into town. We assume he was on horse and buggy, but he could have been in a car. It didn't say it would have been rare, but certainly possible. And he pulls into town, and over one of the buildings, he sees a mysterious ball of light, what we would consider a UFO today or ghostly lights as they explained it back then. Being that it's 1903, he thinks it's probably a burglar or a bank robber or someone practical joker at 1 a.m. on top of a building. So he slows down and proceeds with caution. And as he's approaching, the ball of light vanishes and then reappears on the other side of the street in a matter of a second or so. Some say it actually flew to the other side and then the ball of light vanished, completely gone. Eugene Griffith thought nothing of it until the next day he started talking about it in town, but nobody paid much attention. 1903, people were familiar with the airship flap of the uh, 1896 through 98. They were familiar with weird balls in the sky, so it wasn't a big deal. That is until the next night, Dr. Alcott was sleeping behind his offices and it was about 1 a.m. when a bright light flashed into his room. Extremely bright, it woke him up. He grabbed his gun, which the newspaper said was of immense proportions, and he came outside in the darkness where he encountered a half-human, half-animal. It was said to be an eight-foot-tall, bat-like creature with huge featherless wings. It had a blunt horn coming out of its forehead, and that's where the light was produced. I have to give Dr. Alcott credit. He wasn't frightened. He started shooting this thing, shot it five different times, kept the last bullet for himself if he needed it, went back into his office, 
barricaded the door and waited for the safety of daylight. Let's keep moving down this way. So now we have the next morning, he starts telling his story. As a well-respected physician in town, people really paid attention. Half the town believed they were now dealing with some sort of antediluvian monster. Whereas the other half of the town thought it was still a bank robber or a joker or a hoax. One of those skeptics was Peter Dunn, went by Clarence Dunn, and he was a bank manager at the time of the uh, bank up here. So he left his family on the outskirts of Van Meter by the high school where he lived, grabbed his shotgun filled with buckshot, came down and said, I'm going to protect the town's money from this bank robber, this intruder. So he comes into the bank here, and he's going to camp out overnight. And about 1 a.m. again, he heard something on the east side of the building, which is where Fat Randy's building is here. He said it sounded like somebody was strangling, having trouble breathing. And at that moment, a light started flashing back and forth in front of the bank windows. So bright it said it nearly blinded him. And then he could take it no longer because behind the light, he saw a gigantic form standing here on the main drag. He was so spooked, he shot out the front window of the bank, shooting at this creature. And then he barricaded himself in and he waited for the safety of daylight as well. When he came out, he was expecting to find a dead body or some fur, feathers, fins, blood, something to prove that there was something there that he shot at. But the only thing he found was the broken glass shards all over. That is until they went behind the building and they discovered three giant toad tracks in the soft mud. It was said that he took a plaster cast of one of these prints, but we don't know what happened to it. It could be in someone's basement or attic right now, but we have no idea whether he actually did take it. Watch out for the truck here. Or what happened to it. We'll just let this pass here. So he was convinced he had shot at something that was flesh and blood, something that he should have killed when he shot it. The best part of this is the bank vault's still there. It's now a law firm, but we have permission. We can go in if you want to see the bank vault. Please go in and check it out, and we'll meet back out here on the street. Thank you. Hold on, Bailey. Back up. So sorry. Oh. This is a bolt. All right. Go ahead, Charlie. Barricaded himself in. So. As I said, the next morning, they just found the tracks, and by now, the town was on high alert. We get to the fourth night, when O.V. White, who owned the hardware store, where that peach building is now, it was a big brick hardware store. If you've seen the cover of the book, that's his actual store that he had. He was sleeping above his business in a few rooms he had up there, when all of a sudden, he was woken up in the middle of the night about 1 a.m. as well. This time it sounded like rasps were being rubbed together, like files grinding against each other. He went over to his window and let his eyes adjust to the darkness when he saw the creature seem to be sleeping on a telephone pole. He grabbed his gun, they said he was a great shot, he took deliberate aim and he shot at the monster. But it had no effect except that it was said to have woken the creature up and the creature flashed this light at him and released some foul odor where when it hit Ovi White he said it erased his memory 
He had no idea what happened after that weird smell hit him. But because he had fired at it, Sidney Gregg, another businessman in town, was sleeping across the road. He awoke to the gunshot, went over to the window, and saw this thing descending the telephone pole using its beak like a parrot making its way down to the main street here. And then he said it was hopping around like a kangaroo using its wings for balance and kind of stepping about. That's when they heard the fast mail, the train coming through. And when the train came through, it spooked the creature who stood up on its legs over eight feet tall, started running down the main drag here and then flew off out into the distance of the old abandoned coal mine on the outskirts of town. At this moment, the townsfolk believed that the creature was now living in the old abandoned coal mine. Like some Hollywood horror movie today, it was on the outskirts of town where they believed it was using it as their lair. So that's where we're gonna go next. We're gonna walk a few blocks down here. That's where the mine opening was, just straight ahead of where I'm pointing. You can see some of the old buildings from the brick and tile factory. You can see a lot of the discarded old um, pottery. If you look around here, you'll find little chunks and pieces of the old uh, bowls and pots that they made there as well. So this is where they finally believed the creature was coming from. So on the fifth night, they started hearing more rumbling coming from the old abandoned coal mine. So they went over, surrounded it, and it sounded like Satan and a regiment of his imps were coming up from hell to wage war. That's how the newspaper described it. And then, just as it got dark, all of a sudden the creature appeared out of the mine. But this time it wasn't alone. It had another one with it a smaller version of the creature, whether it was the offspring or the female gender of the species, we don't know. And then the creatures flew off. Nobody knows what happened during the night. It was said that the town turned on every light they had to scare the monsters away. And then just before daybreak, the creatures came back. The newspaper said that the workers shot them with everything they had. It was said they shot them so many times they could have sunk the Spanish fleet. But whether they were the worst shots in Iowa or these things were impervious to their weapons, it had no effect. All it did is released more odor into the crowd and then they descended into the old mine. And like a great Hollywood cliffhanger, that's where the story ended. No follow-ups as to did they dynamite the whole did they kill these things? Are they still there? Did they fly off to become the Mothman of Point Pleasant? We don't know. The mine was covered over. Nobody knows exactly when they covered the mine in, but when we're standing, uh, Kevin and I, when we were standing on top of it, you wouldn't even know that there was a mine underneath you. So that's where the legend really rested for many, many decades. That is until young teenagers started to come out here because they believed it was haunted. These shadowy creatures out here in some of the remnant buildings. They would see bricks being thrown by some unseen force. Weird stuff was happening out here. But because the visitor story had been nearly forgotten, they blamed it on hauntings going on out here. So we're left with the question of what happened out here for five nights. Was this thing simply a misidentified turkey vulture? Or as a recent TV show proclaimed, it was a bat that was projected by light onto a wall and it was a shadow that was scaring everybody. Some believe that it was a creature that was released from the mine, much like the Descent horror movie that they went down and dug up this stuff and released the creature.